Uh, Great. Hi, Bill. Is that you? Yeah, I talked to Tom, and he's in the room. He's going to put us on his speakerphone. Oh, okay. So I'm not sure. No, you're, you're all you're all on uh, right now on the uh, on this phone. It's working now. Wonderful. Okay, great. So um, the first thing that we'd like to do is uh, well, let's take a tip. Apologize for not yeah. being there. Okay. And thanks everyone for for joining us. Um, we'd like to ask someone in the room to volunteer to kind of um, manage the process physically and maybe give us a sense because it's not a video conference call of who needs to, who's, who's interested in saying things and call upon people and if you can help uh, with that if someone could volunteer and we need a second volunteer to take minutes uh, from this meeting because Jeff is also not present and um, uh, it probably is best for someone in the room to take minutes. That said, Johannes Epke is there and it, it help, will help, we'll also take minutes that can supplement those if we need more details. So thank you, Johannes, for doing that. But if one of the commissioners... I'll, I'll volunteer for the, for the okay. first volunteer spot. Uh, okay, and then we that, need... Is that we Carmen? Need, yes, it's Carmen. All right. Okay, great. Thank you very much. And is there someone who will take minutes? I can take minutes. This is Joyce Sanchez. Hi, Joyce. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Okay, wonderful. Uh, well, the first uh, item on our agenda is to uh, approve the previous uh, meeting minutes. So, excuse me, uh, excuse me, Bill. Yes. I think maybe we should take attendance first to see that we have a quorum. Okay, I mean, great. just say who's so, here. I mean, you are here. Bill Kilmartin's here. Carmen Gentile's here. Joyce Sanchez is here. Jay Mars in here. Noble Alexander. Oh, Malone's here. Jeff Clements is on the phone. Oh, I'm on the phone. I'm sorry. I said yes. Okay, Constance is on the phone. So that's eight. Bill Kilmartin, Carmen Gentile, Joyce, Jay, Noble, Bopa, Jeff, and Costas. That's eight. So we have a quorum. Yeah. All right. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Great. So uh, are there any comments um, uh, or changes? Uh, to previous minutes or to previous meeting. Doesn't seem like any. Okay. Can we have a motion to approve? I move that we I approve. Motion to approve the minutes. Second. Bopa. Jay. And Jay Marsden seconded that. Aye. 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 That sounded like eight eyes to me. Right. Great. So, Bill, are you there? Yes, I am. Okay, great. Do you want to talk about the second item? Uh, so, the next one we wanted to talk about uh, setting up the work groups. So, this is a follow on from the discussion we had at the previous meeting. Let me do a sound check. Can people hear me okay? Common, those in the room? Yes. 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 Okay, very good. Uh, so we talked about setting up three work groups, and in that regard, there were three course pieces of correspondence that we might consider um, as we have this discussion and come to a conclusion. Uh, so uh, one, one document that was sent out to folks in advance was a little short document. It talked about a work group charter. And by that, it would just mean a, a simple description of uh, what is the purpose of the work group, who's going to lead the work group, you know, what would be the nature of the work group, uh, reporting back to the full commission. Uh, and the purpose of that is to have uh, memorialized a, uh, a mutual understanding of how these work groups are going to work, and we can and vote upon that as a full commission, and thus, you know, launch these work group efforts. Uh, a second piece of correspondence that was sent to folks in advance uh, came from Jeff, uh, and that was some further guidance uh, just to reiterate uh, conversations that we had previously, uh, how these are uh, working groups who are doing fact-finding and research. Uh, these are not official meetings of the commission, uh, and therefore uh, the activities of these working groups do not arise to the requirements of the open meeting law. 
So that's just additional guidance to keep in mind so that we stay uh, compliant within the parameters of uh, what we need to do. Uh, and then the third item is correspondence that cost us to take a crack at, which is a starter set of who might be joining which work group, you know, based on previous conversations. Process, let me turn that one back to you to, you know, share so, your So, Bill, can I just interrupt you for a moment? Bill, process. Bill, it's Carmen. I just want to interrupt you for a moment. So, I'm informed that the open meeting law requires that the person chairing the meeting be someone who is in the room now. So, you had your earlier asked for a volunteer to oversee things here in the room, so I think we just need to have... Uh, have that person be chairing the meeting to satisfy the open meeting law. Well, uh, well let's get back to that. Good point. So uh, I would recommend that uh, Carmen take the role of temporary chair to chair this meeting. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, Carmen, you're officially chairman for the day. Okay. Thank you. I'll be uh, a asking you for tips. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, hey, we're doing the best we can. You yeah. Know, so, yeah. So, so Bill, uh, particular. if you could just continue before you know, as you were, what you were saying before I interrupted you. Yep. So you know, as as we get into this topic of setting up our work group, which is really essential to our forward progress, you know, uh, Costas has spent some time, you know, based on conversation and in. in uh, previous uh, indications of who might be willing to serve on which work group. So I was going to turn it over to Costas to take us through his thoughts. Uh, again, this is all on the lines of trying to set up these work groups. So I was going to pass it over to Costas. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so uh, essentially, we had discussed uh, creating four committees or working groups. Um, one of them was around, broadly speaking, around the money and politics uh, questions. The other was around the question of corporations as artificial entities. And then we also discussed the communications group and a drafting committee. Uh, what we have done, um, largely on the basis of some conversations we've already had as a group and on um, people's backgrounds and experiences, is more or less assigned um, committees uh, people to each of these committees uh, that they have either expressed interest in serving on or that it makes sense to us. Now, this is not um, etched in stone anywhere, uh, but we try to keep the commitment uh, as balanced as possible and to uh, leverage people's expertise as it was um, evident to us based on your experiences. So we uh, Kate, we took a crack at creating the money and politics group, the corporations group, and the communications group. Uh, but we left for now the drafting uh, committee uh, unassigned with the thought that um, that might, it might become uh, more obvious later what needs to be done there and that those individuals uh, at this point uh, you know, may not necessarily have much to draft and so could be helpful on some of these other um, committees as we explore the uh, data gathering phases of our uh, work here. So, uh, Bill, um, you circulated the proposed appointments, is that right? Uh, I don't think I sent the document that had the names on it. Is that the document to which I, have, I haven't received yes. anything. Yes. I haven't received Yeah, maybe you could send it around now. Oh, okay. Find it out, I suppose. Costas and Bill, yeah. I'm not sure if you've been receiving messages, but um, N Nico, mm -hmm. Carol, and Jennifer are using your number and the code, and they're not able to get in or get on. Uh, Cheryl's on. Cheryl's on? Right. I was so able to get in. Mm -hmm. So Nico just sent a message, and Jennifer... And Scott, they can't get in because the bridge is full, it says. The bridge is full. So I'm not sure what we can do about that. That sounds like a framing and state issue because... Um, well, you know, we could, have, sure we could have, have... I mean, we could have each of them call one of the cell phones here and put, put it on speaker, and that way we'd be able to... Why don't we try that? Why don't... Uh, let's see, who, who's, who doesn't have... Who doesn't have access right now? 
Nico. Nico is one of them. Okay, so Nico, why don't what, what is, uh, why, why don't we have Nico call me, and I'll put it on speakerphone. My number is 508-380-6000. Uh, is someone is someone emailing him? Okay, I'll, I'll take care. I'll, I'll email Nico. So, okay. uh, what's the number, Carmen? 508-380-6097. Yeah. Okay, and then uh, Jennifer is the second person, so do we have a number for her? Yeah, you can give her mine. It's 617-306-1567. Uh, Yeah, no one's going to give you one. Hang on. Okay. 508-816-8868. Okay. Great. So I've emailed all those individuals, and hopefully they'll get the email and try and try it again. Okay. So I think if... Uh, as people call in, we'll, we'll recognize them. Um, so, Bill, can you tell me, uh, did you have some specific people in mind for the money and elections ballot initiatives uh, um, committee? Hello? Yes. yes Jan, you're on. Let me, let me just go ahead, and uh, we didn't circulate this in advance, but here's what we've got for the money and politics group. But before I just rattle off these names, let me just say that uh, even if someone's not specifically assigned to a group, it doesn't mean that they can't either formally or informally be involved. Or Our sense is that all commissioners will be interested in all of these groups. It's just a matter of um, dividing up the labor in such a way that makes sense and making people kind of primarily um, responsible for certain aspects of this work or, or to focus everyone's energy. But under no um, circumstances do we expect that if you're in one of these groups that there's, there's absolutely no way to get involved in what the other group is doing even in the um, meetings and sessions and research that uh, that these groups hold. We do have to be somewhat careful that these groups don't get so large that they trigger the open meeting requirements um, even for the um, committees. Okay. So we, we try to keep that in mind. So money and politics, we've got um, no Noble, Jeff Clements, uh, Carmine, Matthew McKnight, Dominic, uh, and, and Bill and I are sort of ex officio on, on, on all of these, but those are the um, individuals on that one. We've got uh, Nick. What about on the Corporations Michael. and Entities, the Corporations and Entities Committee? Yeah, so uh, Nicholas, Michael, Scott, and Jennifer on the Corporations and Entities. And then uh, Communications, Cheryl, Lopa, Jay and Joyce. Okay, and then we're no, nothing right now on the uh, on the fourth committee, the communication right. and public outreach. We thought we'd focus people's energy first on kind of doing the bulk of the data gathering work and the research and the proposals for the substantive committees, and then think about uh, drafting and whatever else uh, has to take place, which we probably all will have some role in. Okay. Um, Bill, where would you like to go? Uh, what, what's the next item you'd like to address? Well, let's have a discussion about these, you know, suggested assignments. Okay. And see if people are comfortable with the assignments. And then let's continue that discussion to see if at least one of those people could volunteer to lead each work group. It's cost us that I would like to work with those persons uh, about a schedule and, and other details that could follow. Oh, okay. So let's discuss the uh, you know potential assignments and then uh, hopefully a volunteer for each of the three. Okay, workers. sure. So the first group was the money and elections with Noble, Jeff, Carmen, Matt, and Dominic. And uh, is there someone in that group that would really that's really you know, eager to be on one of the other two groups or doesn't want to be on that first group? So. 
Who would like to be the uh, subcommittee chair there? Jeff? <laughs> uh, sure, I'd be happy to. Okay. <laughs> Jeff is the <laughs> subcommittee <laughs> chair. All right. Moving right along. I'm not sure this matters, but Jeff is also the secretary, so we. I just want to be mindful of everything we're asking him to do. I have right. no objections, but I just want to make sure right. we think well, about that. Yeah, well, if you want, want something done, you ask a busy person, right? Yep. <laughs> so, uh, if you feel <laughs> overloaded or overwhelmed, Jeff, you let us know. We'll, we'll have to make a change. Yeah, I sure, I sure oh. will. Okay. Thank and you. You're welcome. So the second group, the Corporations and Entities Subcommittee, Nick, Mike, Michael, and uh, Jennifer, and who's the, who's the other Scott. person? Scott McDermott. The Scott other. McDermott. Um, anyone there who would really much prefer to be in another committee or not on that committee? Not me, Scott. Oh, did Scott just volunteer? What's that? No. So who would like to be the subcommittee chair there? So do we have, uh, I mean, is Nick uh, on the phone or is he still in limbo? Let's see. Nick, are you here? No? You know something? I, I don't have any. No one's called my phone. Hold on. <laughs> hi, who's this? Oh, hi. Okay. Just in time to volunteer, Nick. Time. Great job. Nick, Nick, Nick you've been... Uh, you've you've been... Uh, uh, Where am I? Yeah, you, you're all, we're all together, and you've been nominated to be on the, uh, on the Corporations and Entities Subcommittee. How do you like that? Great. All right. So now we'll, you're on there with uh, Michael, Scott, and Jennifer on that uh, subcommittee. Sorry, I'm having a difficult time understanding what you're saying. I'm sorry. Uh, you're on the Corporations and Entities Subcommittee. Okay. And you're on there with uh, Michael, Scott, and Jennifer. Okay. So we're, we're asking whether Jennifer, uh, Scott, Michael, or you would like to be the chair of that subcommittee. Oh, okay. oh. well, thank you for volunteering. <laughs> thank you. Uh, OK. okay. This is this is uh, Nick. Yes. This is Carmen Jennifer. Was that was that Nick that volunteered? <laughs> <laughs> I muted you. You're all set. Don't worry about it, Jeff. So, so Nick, thank you for stepping up and uh, volunteering to chair that uh, subcommittee. Appreciate it very much. Now we're moving on to a third subcommittee, which is how to advance, how to achieve advance the proposed constitutional amendment, and we have. I can't read my handwriting on that. I see Joyce, Jay, is it Bob, and I'm not sure who the four. I think that's communication. Yeah, that's communication. Yeah. Jay and Joyce. Oh, communications? Yeah. Is that the communication? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got him. I got him both. A nice try. Nice try. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So the communication. Okay, the communications committee. So who's on the communications committee? It's, it's myself, Bopa, Cheryl, and Joyce. Okay. And who would like to chair that committee? Unless my colleagues have any objection, I'll I'll take that one if that helps. I think that's true. Right. Right. Great. No objection. That's tremendous. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Who would like to volunteer? That was me. Okay. So, what what do you think might be a good next order of business, uh, Bill? Uh, uh, Costas is with us also. Background noise here. Somebody might be rustling papers or something. Uh, who volunteered to uh, chair the uh, communications subcommittee? That was me, Bill. Jay Martin. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. So, my. So, on this topic, uh, Costas, maybe mm -hmm. you and I can follow up with Jeff and Nick and, and Jay. Yep. Uh, about some further details, get those three subcommittees launched and out of schedule and so forth. Does that sound yeah, okay? Yes, so we'll, we will uh, we'll reach out and touch base with uh, the subcommittee chairs directly. Uh, you did see the proposed memo, just the 
about getting some, you know, a basic sense of the um, the main purpose of these groups. But we are going to um, work with uh, each of the groups to ensure that uh, the research in these specific areas is, is being done, and then have regular reports back to the full commission uh, at upcoming meetings about some of the findings and results. And again. Um, some of that will overlap with what the commission is doing, testimony as a group, uh, with all sorts of things that we're all doing uh, together. But at least some of the heavy lifting in terms of the research and, you know, whatever our thinking is in these areas, at least some of that uh, can start to be done in the working groups or the committees. And so we expect that the committees will need to arrange to have at least some uh, meetings on their own or some discussions. They don't have to be in-person meetings, but uh, however it is, each group decides to pursue its work as long as um, we have a, an idea of um, the kinds of things that they'll be working on uh, and, and that that's getting done so that we can bring it to the full commission in a timely manner. Okay. So um, that sounds good. Uh, yeah. You know, comment to those in, in the room. Uh, we want to turn our attention to a discussion with Mike Sullivan, who's great to be to be there. That's right. I just uh, spoke also, with him uh, and he's uh, any other yeah. public comments should there be any. And then as we head towards the conclusion, we we'll just have to pick a uh, time and place of a discussion about the next full commission meeting. Okay. And so, Carmen, just because I'm not I'm not yet, do we have any uh, visitors or any uh, any folks there from the public who wish to? With us, uh, I, I only see 22 people raising their hands. <laughs> no, only only five of the 22 raised their hands. Okay, just to give us a sense of, of you know the, the the timeline for the meeting here and what we need to allow yep. for for uh, public public so comments. So maybe we so. should uh, we should we should spend some time now with Mr. Sullivan and uh, yeah. either conclude with him or. Or we could take a break and, and the answers to go with the public and then go back to him. But why don't we start off with, with uh, Michael Sullivan now. Thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you. And oh, by the way, we have, uh, we have with us from the Framingham State University, Peter Chisholm, who uh, put this all together for us. Thank you, Peter. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you. Um, so, uh, Mr. Sullivan, what elections does the OCPF uh, responsible for regulating in Massachusetts? Uh, we're responsible for everything from governor down to whatever the lowest rate is that you can find in the Commonwealth. All right, thank you. And uh, would you give us a brief, let's say three minutes tops, overview of campaign finance law in Massachusetts? Well, it's heavily, it, it's heavily focused on what is uh, the statute at the federal level. Much of our statute tracks what the FEC deals with. I hope the uh, people believe that we do it a little more effectively than the FEC. But that's, uh, that's an issue that can be debated. Um, we spend a lot of time on education. We spend less time on enforcement. We think that education is far more important than enforcement unless there's a big problem. Uh, we try to work with people to get them to understand the law. We know that it's a niche law. There's not a lot of people in the state who understand our statute. Um, First-time candidates, we try to get them into our seminar. Uh, we, we do a lot of outreach. And um, it, it, it's a, probably one of the more restrictive campaign finan finance laws in the state, uh, in the country. Uh, when I go to our national conference and I hear about other states who have no limits on what people can give and no limits on what corporations can do uh, and no limits on what parties can do. It, it's, um, it's interesting to say the least. Um, I would say that my colleagues around the country think that we are among the most restrictive states uh, in the union. What limitations do exist on contributions to influence elections in the Commonwealth? Well, I think you look at the at the the amount limits first and foremost. Our amount limits, which were changed about three or four years ago for individuals, are a thousand dollars per person per year to a particular candidate. Uh, PACs can give five hundred dollars. Corporations can't give anything. The state party 
can provide a $3,000 check to uh, a candidate, and they can also pay all of that candidate's expenses, which are known as in-kind contributions. A local party can give $1,000 to a candidate. A ballot question committee cannot give to a candidate uh, because a ballot question committee has no limitations. They can raise money from any source in any amount. Uh, so you're can looking at... So the way, the way, the best way for people to understand it, and the best way for us to describe it when we do a seminar, is that if you get any kind of a corporate check, whether it's an LLC, a limited partnership, et cetera, you should probably call that person and determine exactly what they are, because the only type of business entity that can give is a sole proprietorship. So unless you're a sole proprietor, then no other business can give any money in Massachusetts. That's correct. That's directly Thank to a you. campaign. Um, can we talk about that, the independent expenditure aspect of this and sure. uh, how those kinds of contributions are tracked and monitored and reported? So let's talk a little bit about uh, express advocacy and how it works. Corporations can give money to a super PAC. They can spend money on their own, and those entities can and, but they have to do it without coordination with a candidate. It's not at the request or suggestion of. Uh, it's not in cooperation or consultation with. And so how do you figure out what's coordination and what's not? It's very difficult. Uh, we've got a couple of interpretive bulletins that we've put together that talk about firewalls. Um, but I think that there are probably people out there who spend as much time trying to figure out how to get around a firewall as we spend trying to create one. So. Um, I don't think we've seen as much corporate involvement as I expected originally. Um, we see a lot of union involvement as well, not to mention corporate involvement. They're both involved. Um, I didn't know if I said that it would beep, but uh, it's, uh, it's emerging, I guess is the best word to use. Um, and we call super PACs IE PACs, independent expenditure PACs, so those are synonyms. Uh, and you can go on our website uh, which, by the way, I don't know how many of you have been to there, been there, but it's a treasure trove of information that you paid for, so you want to take a look at it at ocpf.us. All independent expenditure spending is there, all IE PAC spending is there, all candidate spending is there as well. So if you wanted to go in and spend the time to do the searches, you'll be able to figure out which corporations are the most involved, which unions are the most involved, which individuals are the most involved, uh, and it runs the gamut, and oftentimes it depends on <coughs> Who's friendly with who and who wants to do something for somebody? Can you tell us what types of election or political funds do not have contribution limits, if any? Super PACs, ballot questions. Super PACs and ballot questions, any amount. Any amount. Any amount. And when a super PAC takes the money, the super PAC is going to spend it, and those are called expenditures, not contributions, because they're going to spend it to support or oppose a candidate, but they're going to do it without cooperation or consultation, like I just mentioned a minute ago. And that's what that's the difference between a contribution, which contributions are limited, versus an expenditure, which expenditures are not if they're not made in coordination with. Okay, that, that really is an explanation of the difference between an expenditure, independent expenditure and a uh, contribution. It's an all-day seminar if you really want to do it. Okay, we'll, we'll opt out. Hey, Mike, can I ask a question? Yeah. This is Bill. The, yeah. uh, so apparently there's uh, fairly different rules based on the nature of the election, whether it's an individual or a ballot question. It's fairly different rules based on the nature of the entity, uh, whether it's a super PAC, a PAC, a party, or an individual. Right. There's probably some underlying logic as to why it's se separated, segmented, differentiated this way. So that's really my question is, could you just give us a little bit of thinking, of what's, that, what's that underlying logic as to why it's set up this way? I don't think there is underlying logic, Bill. Um, I honestly think that all campaign finance law that is made is reactive. It either reacts to a problem or a scandal or a court decision. And so what you end up with, it, to, to some respect, in some respect, is a hodgepodge yeah, or a mishmash of, of statute. I mean, why is the individual limit 1,000? 
why is the state party limit 3,000 but the local party committee limit is 1,000? Um, you know, what is the quid pro quo issue that's involved? So when court cases come down or there's some kind of a, a, uh, a scandal, that seems to be when the statutes are changed. Interesting. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So how has the Supreme Court's decision in Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission affected your ability to enforce the Commonwealth's campaign finance laws? I don't think it has. I think what it's done is created another layer for us to administer and oversee. Um, you know, those of you who don't know me in the room, I'm also a football official and a baseball umpire. So if we set up the rules, my job is to administer the rules and use common sense. So my job is not to make up the rules. I don't decide what the strike zone is in baseball. Um, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm the person who's there to enforce it. It's the same thing here. Um, I don't get to set up the rules. I don't get to make the decisions in the court cases. But once they're laid out, um, pretty much we've got to try to interpret it and move it forward for everybody to understand and get ready for the next election. Are there any uh, substantial differences uh, in uh, regulations regarding um, super PAC for contributions to super PACs and other IEs and the state level um, re uh, tracking, monitoring, and reporting disclosure? Well, so let's talk a little bit about the disclosure end of the deal. Um, if an independent expenditure, let's let's just choose a company, ABC Company. If ABC Company on its own, with its own money, decides to make an expenditure, an independent expenditure, they're required to file a report within, it's either seven or 10 business days. I'm off the top of my head, I think it's seven. And then within 24 hours, if the expenditure occurs within tw uh, 10 days of the election. If ABC Company gives a super PAC money, the super PAC isn't required to disclose that contribution from ABC Company until they use it to make an independent expenditure. And they still have the same seven days to do that and the same 24-hour deal within the ten, uh, last 10 days of an election. So if ABC Company gives uh, you know, the Smith Super PAC a million dollars in June and they don't use that money until late August in the pri before the uh, primary occurs, no one's going to know that until that, ha uh, until that money is spent. And how do we track whether the money that the super PAC uses from, say, ABC company uh, is, is actually the money they got from ABC, or is it from some other company, for example, right? I mean, could they, could they potentially amass large sums of money and then mass spending uh, because the timing of it is, is not correct? I mean, if they get a contribution from ABC company, mm -hmm. it's not necessarily for a specific purpose, so if they raise say $10 million and spend $10 million, then uh, it's unclear how much of that is ABC's money and how much of it might be from other uh, donors. Well, the best way I can answer that is to say that in the last four or five years, we've done 20 disposition agreements for funneling of contributions and, and fined people over a million dollars, uh, mostly in candidate uh, races, but in a ballot question race as well. It is difficult to trace money. Uh, we use our website as an investigative tool by uh, analyzing all the data that we have. For example, if a candidate uh, lists a bunch of contributions from one company, uh, from, one, from a bunch of individuals from one company, and they're all giving the max and they've never given before, that's you know, pretty much a bright light that, hey, maybe we ought to take a look at this. Uh, probably the the biggest one that we did was the Families for Excellence Schools case with the charter schools in 2016, where the money went to uh, the money went to a C3, who then gave it to a C4, and the C4 gave it to the ballot question committee. And once we unmasked and peeled back and found out where the money was coming from, we realized that there were a, a lot of people giving a lot of money uh, to the C3, knowing that their identity was going to be hidden through the C4. So a lot of it is the, anal the analysis that we do with our data. And honestly, I've been doing this long enough, and my staff has been doing this long enough. A lot of it is trust your gut. If it doesn't look right, it usually isn't. And the example I'll give you is we had a company in East Boston that, where several of their employees were making maximum donations to a mayoral candidate in Weymouth. They had the trash contract in Weymouth. It didn't make sense 
that a lower level administrative person within the trash company who lived in Woburn was making a maximum donation and had never given before to anyone was making a maximum donation to the candidate for mayor in Weymouth. Uh, so we subpoenaed some records and, and these things take time. One of the things I say in our seminar is investigations, it's not like watching Law and Order. You don't get it done in 49 minutes with commercials. It, it takes six, eight, ten months because you're subpoenaing records and you have to go through layers and layers of subpoenas to get the information. But a lot of it is trust your gut. Sometimes you'll get a complaint um, from somebody who watches it very closely. Sometimes we have an issue at the local level as well. Okay. Um, what type of data does the OCP have to collect? Uh, whatever people file with us. You know, they, uh, in terms of spending data and contributed data, it's all on our. It's all on the website. I mean, there's an actual data uh, tab that you can go to and search to your heart's content. It's. I mean, I think we have a great system. I will tell you that. When we do the national conference, that system is the envy of a lot of states that don't have that kind of ability. Um, you can go, I'll go home tonight, look up your hometown and find out who's given $500 or more to X candidate, or who's given $500 or more to any candidate, or how many plumbers in your town gave money to X candidate. It, it's all there, it can be sorted and finessed, uh, sent out to an Excel spreadsheet, whatever you want to do with it, and we do an awful lot of that. Um, we have uh, some investigative people, and. When I started, we did not have an IT department. We now have three full-time people uh, who write our software. We don't do any outside contracting. And um, we've become decent at it. I'm not going to say we're excellent at it, but we're pretty good at it. And that's how we do it. So can, can you tell us how many people in Massachusetts, how many registered voters in Massachusetts contribute, make political contributions? No. Okay. I have no idea. Okay. Something I've never thought about. But I can tell you that if you make one, you're generally going to make more than one. Okay. Does that count? Do you have an idea how much money comes into Massachusetts from outside the Commonwealth? Or no, but you could do the data search. Yeah. Okay. That, that would take you two minutes to do. Probably two minutes. Literally two minutes. So are there challenges, uh, this is Constance Panagopoulos again, sorry to be asking uh, Go ahead. All right. my fair share of questions here, but a couple of things. First of all, are there uh, specific challenges that you've encountered uh, in the aftermath of Citizens United um, in terms of reconciling the federal uh, regulations with our state regulations, or are there areas in which you think that state law is actually uh, better than federal and regulations and process um, uh, that might be of interest to this group? Well, with all due respect to my friend Ellen Weintraub, I think things at the federal level are a mess. Mm -hmm. um, and they basically tie two to two and they can't get any regulations passed. They put out notices of rulemaking, uh, I think it's called an NPRM, and they never are able to do any rules or agree on any rules. Uh, at least one of the unique things about my job is that the statute gives the director um, the right, the ability, the directive to issue and promulgate rules. And so we've done that on a number of occasions. That's where we came up with the coordination rules, which are loosely based on California, uh, as well as uh, what has been thought of at the federal level. in politics, obviously, in the aftermath of Citizens United, um, we will certainly need um, as much data and information as possible from your office uh, about how to monitor and track this um, all the time so that we can reflect on changes before and after um, that Supreme Court case. So as far as what's available to us as a group and to the public or what could be made accessible to us, uh, even if it's some proprietary information, are there things that uh, you think would be useful to us as a commission that we need to have as, as information in, in order to uh, be able to put this in our reports and to take these uh, patterns into account when, when thinking about um, the rest of our activities as a commission in the area of corporate money and politics specifically? 
Well, I would answer that first off by saying there's no proprietary information uh, on, our, on our website. Uh, you all, everybody sitting in this room paid for that. Uh, and it's out there and it's open for disclosure. Um, how you want to massage it is entirely up to you. If, if people want to come in and make an appointment and sit down and, and have us work with you to teach you how to use our data set, uh, which really isn't that difficult, we're certainly glad to do that. Um, yeah. What I ought to point out when you're talking about corporate money is some of you may have heard about the, the uh, court case 1A Auto versus me, um, which our, our SJC declared that Section 8, which is the ban on corporate, uh, co corporate contributions, was upheld. And it was uh, appealed to the uh, Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court decided not to uh, issue a writ. So that is considered good law. And um, there shouldn't be any more challenges to our corporate, uh, our corporate prohibition. In terms of online, you mean like Facebook ads and things like that? Yeah, yeah. kind of online um, advertising. Yeah. yeah, social media is a, is a troublesome spot for us. Um, it's hard to know where to start and where to end. Um, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not inclined to try to regulate Twitter. Um, I know there are some, we don't have foreign bots, I don't think, involved at, at our level. Um, no, one's, no one has ever brought that up to me. Um, but I would mention, by the way, just to give credit where credit is due, although Ellen has, has played a large role in this, it was really Ann Ravel, uh, who's from California, who was a former FEC commissioner, that's the one that first sounded the alarm on this. Uh, and uh, Ann, Ann basically left the commission in frustration because they really couldn't get anything done. Um, we require, obviously, disclosure of expenditures. So if you take out a Facebook ad, we're going to get disclosure. But in terms of regular social media, I don't think we've seen very much uh, where I would be worried. And certainly, I would be more worried if I got complaints, and I haven't had any complaints. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So, is there any noteworthy contribution or ex uh, an expenditure data that OCPF does not track? Well, it depends on who considers what noteworthy, I guess. Okay. Um, I don't think so. I mean, we try to capture the entire playing field of what's being raised and what's being spent. Um, I don't know if we're always successful. Um, and I'll give you an example. One of the systems that we have um, in terms of disclosure is called the depository system. And banks are involved. And all activity is supposed to go through the bank, through that bank's checking account. If it doesn't go through the account, we're not going to capture it. And we've had a number of cases where we've uh, brought people in and said, you know, your account says you've only spent 200 bucks, but there are signs all over the county. What's up? And they'll be like, oh, I, yeah, I spent 20 grand at the printer. Yeah, but it didn't go through your account, and it wasn't disclosed, so we need to talk about that. But that's got nothing to do with coordination. So did you earlier say that a party, a state party, a party could contribute uh, any amount in kind? In kind, sure, yeah. So does that mean a party could could give you 10,000 signs to put up? Yes, absolutely. Okay. If you look at, if you look at, um, take a look at the year-end reports for any statewide, well, any gubernatorial statewide candidate over the last 12 years, roughly. And you'll see on their year-end report, they will list a telephone number in terms of what in-kind contributions are from the state party. 2.7 million or whatever the number might be. Um, and that's because parties can raise money at five thousand uh, dollars per person, so if you give five thousand dollars to the party committee, the party committee more than likely is going to use it to try to get their standard bearer elected. Can the federal party make contributions to the state party? That's a bit more tricky. Um, so the technical answer to your question is no. The 
federal committee cannot give money to the state party committee. Each state party has two accounts. They have a state account and a federal account. So as I, as an individual, can give $5,000 to the state account of the state party, and I can then give $10,000 to the federal account of the state party. That money that is in the federal account is ostensibly to be used for federal candidates. But if the party runs an ad, and that ad says, elect Senator Warren, don't forget about candidate X who's running for state senate. Federal rules require that that money be spent out of the federal account because it's a federal candidate. And their rules trump our rules. So a, a state candidate could piggyback with the federal candidate and the federal funds could pay for it. And the federal funds pay for it. I've seen that. It's not widespread, but I have seen it. And it's up to the, I mean, the parties know this. Right, so yeah. they, they know how to do it, and they're, they're not going to do it for just anybody. Are there any problems with our... With I feel like I'm on the witness stand. Can I just say that? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't take an oath or anything. I'm no, uncomfortable. Not, not, we can put you under oath. Has yeah. your time expired yet? Nico has a question. What's that? Nico has a question. Are there any rules governing No. There are some cities that have tried. I don't know anything about the lobbying end of the deal. I don't, I don't deal with that at all. I, I, I read somewhere uh, in the Globe the other day that you now have to register as a lobbyist in, in Boston, but I don't know the first thing about it other than what I saw in that story. Um, some cities and towns occasionally will call us and tell us that they want to enact their own campaign finance law. We tell them to talk to their uh, city solicitor or their town council. And if they're going to do a bylaw, to go to the Attorney General's office, their local government division, and make sure that whatever they want to do passes muster. Is that, is that helpful? Yeah, but I also just have a question about cities acting in their own interests. So there are ballot questions that affect cities, cities lobby at the state level and the state house. Uh, how is that practiced? Uh, there are no limits. If I understand your question correctly, there are no limits for, for uh, ballot questions at any level, state level or local level, nor could they be put in constitutionally uh, under a, a case I believe is Mass Citizens for Life versus, no, Bank, Bank of America versus Bilotti, um, I think is the one that talks about ballot questions. Uh, and in ter again, in terms of the lobbying at the state level and what they do, I, I don't know anything about that. Other questions? Is there any other? Like, uh, Go ahead. This has been very educational, and you know I think we want to uh, continue the dialogue. So, any thoughts or advice you might give to uh, this commission, and I guess most specifically, you know, the subcommittee that we uh, that you heard us just uh, you know set up, uh, doing further research and fact finding. Uh, any suggestions of how we might proceed? I think it wouldn't hurt you to invite in for conversation, maybe not testimony. Some of the, and I don't know if they'll come, but some of the folks who actually do the raising and the spending. And you can probably get you know, the data from what corporations or what super PACs uh, they're from, and they might be willing to have a conversation with you about it uh, and how they do what they do. I'm not, I'm not you know, on the front line devising a firewall to ensure that OCPF doesn't come after me because on the one hand, you know, we gave a candidate money and on the other hand, we want to do an independent expenditure for him or her. But I think it's important, you know, it's great to talk to bureaucrats and, and I'm a proud bureaucrat and been there a long time, but I'm, I haven't been on the front lines in a campaign in an awful long time, uh, which by the way is wonderful. I haven't written a campaign check in 32 years um, and don't intend to do it anytime soon. But if you don't talk to them, I think you're missing an opportunity to make sure that you understand the entire depth of the issue. Mm -hmm. I think that's such a great idea. Is there a, um, is there a law firm or uh, someone that can help with this who's a trustworthy person? Uh, 
uh, not to put someone on the spot, but Jeff, you might know better than I do. <laughs> Crickets. <laughs> um, I, I, you know, I don't. I'm not going to give a name. Um, I, I can point you to where you can find that information, uh, and, and maybe deal with some of the consultants out there. But I, I'm not going to yeah. put out a name for, for public consumption. Yeah, could you uh, could you do that, uh, Mike, and uh, point us in the right direction? Yeah. And then just. Uh, on behalf of my uh, fellow commissioners, uh, in expectation that we might eventually get to this point, I had reached out to uh, a fellow who I know who does the fundraising, did the fundraising for Governor Deval Patrick. Mm -hmm. And he'd be happy to come in and spend time with him. It's a fellow named Sean Carr. Uh, and he also knows others that uh, do similar things, both for his Democrat and Republican. And uh, so if you want, I could follow up with him and see if he'd be willing to come in. I'm sure he had, I am sure he'd be willing to accept an invitation for a conversation if we want. He's from Springfield, and, uh, right? Mike, if you could point us in the direction of some additional ones, that would be swell. Is Sean from Springfield, Bill? Uh, Sean Curran lives in uh, Sudbury. Sudbury, oh, okay. Somebody, Curran, uh, not Alan Solomon might be. Uh, Alan Solomon would be a good mm -hmm. uh, candidate for this. Yeah. And you might want to talk to some candidates who, who you know, have an interest in this and, and what they've gone through. I mean, we've had a number of situations with. <clears throat> excuse me, where PACs, because they didn't know the rules, regular PACs made excess contributions uh, in kind, and we've had to deal with that. Um, there's, you know, every, everyone understands the rules a little bit differently, and my job is to try to enforce them all equally. It's like that strike zone. That's great advice, yeah. Are there any particular problems that your office has faced, has faced specifically as a result of Citizens United? <clears throat> no. Is there anything else that you'd like to uh, tell us can about? I just, jump, can I just jump in? Since we've talked a lot, asked you a few times about citizens, yeah. um, but haven't explicitly asked you about the Speak Now decision, which, as you know, is the one that opened the floodgates for the super PAC. Yeah. Can I just ask that same question? How has Speak Now affected your ability to enforce our laws? I don't think it has. I mean, I don't think any. Once these court cases are decided, uh, we figure out a regulatory scheme to make them work. And we just go from there. And we try to transmit that information and, and those schemes to everybody so that they understand. And we try to get, you know, my goal is to get as much disclosure as quickly as possible and get it up on our website so that everybody can see what they need to see. OK, I'm, I'm thank thinking. You. A, thank you. It's a great website, by the way. I have studied it because I'm kind of nosy that way. <laughs> Yeah, I'm thinking Thank now you. we might we might want to move on to get some public testimony. We have a full room of. Can I just ask one more thing before Mike okay. comes away here? So can sure. you just give us a sense from your point of view how your office thinks about quid pro quo corruption? How when you say how we think about it, I mean we, we think it's illegal. <laughs> <laughs> right, but I mean how how would you define it? Is it one of those things that you know you you know it when you see it, or uh, how, how do you? How do you um, determine whether or not you've, in fact, encountered a situation of quid pro quo corruption? Um, well, no one's ever going to admit that to me. And I don't, I don't think I've ever really seen it. But, and it is a case, you know, I don't focus on the next result. I focused on the first result. I think the next result, the, the quid pro quo stuff, is where the AG would get involved. If I thought that the money was given for the purpose of getting some kind of a vote. Um, I would probably immediately refer that to the AG. Because that's our big stick. You know, I, A lot of people think that we can actually do the fining. We can't. All of the fines that we do are negotiated settlements. Because our big stick is to refer something to the AG for prosecution. Do you have information on the um, cases that you have referred to? I'm sorry. When, 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 I'd like to invite, at this point, the public to ask questions, some questions of Mr. Sullivan before we, uh, before we, before he leaves. And so, is there, would you like to ask Mr. Sullivan a question? Sure. I was sure. just wondering if that's doc documented for the public. What cases that you have referred to the AG? Um, all the cases that have been resolved are on our website, um, I think. And and if they're not, there's probably been enough press that a simple Google search, Google search. And I can give you an example. Wilkerson, uh, John Bonomo. Uh, we referred the uh, Thornton Law Firm case, which uh, was referred.
transferred at, at the federal level as well. They deadlocked on their vote. Um, my vote was to send it to the AG. The AG referred it uh, because it was a potential conflict on her part to the Essex County DA, um, who did a huge forensic review and really couldn't come up with anything concrete. Um, there are little cases that we send to the AG sometimes that you would probably not care about, but because the person that we're dealing with is uncooperative, I send it anyway, because that's our stick. Um, and that's how, I, that's how I get people to the table. Sorry. Could you tell us your name? Um, my name is Julie Kasai. I'm a volunteer with uh, People Cover Not Murders, and I'm volunteering to help on the research committee. Thank you. Um, um, so there was a question early on about uh, the number of registered voters who actually donate. Is that a field on the database, no. whether or not the person is registered voter? Is there any linking of the database to register voter database? No. Okay. Um, the second question, um, well, it's a question probably for the commission as well. Um, to the extent that the commission uh, may be analyzing the data, um, to what extent should they be doing it in collaboration with your office? Would you want to sign off on things that the commission does with the data? Or is it I think really we, can have that, we can have that conversation. Okay. It's kind of an open-ended question, okay. um, but we can have that conversation. And my staff and I are, are willing to sit down with people and, and show them what's on the database, make sure that they understand where they're going with it. Yeah, that's pretty basic stuff for us. We do a lot of that, actually. Any comments? For the benefit of those that are on the phone, uh, we can hear Michael quite well, but others uh, are very faint. So perhaps uh, somebody could repeat the question or either stand closer to the microphone just so that we can follow along. Okay, we'll, we'll do that with the next question, sure. Any other questions of Mr. Sullivan? Yes, well, could you come up? Yeah. Could you come uh, over my here? Name is Matt Keith. No, no, I'd like you to come over here. Okay. Right, right there, there you go. Okay. My name is Matt Keeper. I'm in New Bedford. And I don't know if this would necessarily be within the scope, but basically my question is, um, it sounds like your office actually has a pretty good handle on like contributions from individuals and corporations and other entities like that. And you mentioned a little bit that like we're kind of like the envy of other states. And yeah. I'm wondering what kind of sense you have of like what it's like in other states, I guess. Um, well, I'll give you an example. Oh. Kentucky is trying to right now require electronic filing of their reports and building a website similar to ours to put the information up. Uh, there are other states who will only put up PDFs of reports, so they're not sortable. Okay. Um, there are some states that have moved along, um, but they use they kind of use ours as the standard that they try to get to. I think. I mean, that's what they tell me. So you get a sense that a lot of them are kind of far behind? I do, yeah. I do. And I will say this as a kudos to my IT guy. Our, our director of IT was originally an auditor in our office, so he understands what it is that we do, and he's able to put that into the code uh, and, and allow people to be able to search and find what they need to find. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Yes, come up. Come up. Yeah. Hi. Uh, you can come over here. Mm -hmm. so we're trying to get you to these oh, two mics. No problem. These two mics. Yeah. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Matt Mazzola. I'm from Attleboro, and I just two questions because I'm not really related whatsoever, but it's kind of quick. Uh, first one is how far back does your website track uh, you know, campaign contributions? 2002 is when we started. 2002 is when we started, okay. That website and those, and those contributions data source, that's a result of the clean elections ballot question. Okay. That was part of that. And then second one is, so you mentioned before that there was a challenge to the corporation's uh, ban mm -hmm. uh, financing. How often do our laws here in Massachusetts get challenged in court? Not very. Not very often? No, I haven't been a defendant a whole lot of times. Okay. When they sue me, it's really good when they say, in his official capacity only. <laughs> <laughs> Not personal. Not personal. Okay. okay. Uh, well, thank you very much for your testimony today. We appreciate you coming. Have a good rest of the meeting. I'm going to go have dinner. Thank All right. You. Thank you. Okay, so I think I'm... Phil, I've, and uh, Carlos, I think at this point we'll open it up for some questions or, or some testimony from some testimony from people present. May I point out uh, an oversight before the oh, Hold on, just yes. a second. Go ahead, Bill Carlos. I'm sorry. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. That's great. Right. Okay. All right. So, uh, is there someone who would like to offer some testimony? Actually, you raised your hand first, so you're first. Where, where would you like to come over here? You can you can sit down if you if you like. 
and, and I'm going to put this microphone over here so that the video will get you what you're saying. And uh, yeah, we'll keep that. We'll keep that chair as anybody who testifies. Okay, anyone who chair. testifies will go to that. Yeah, chair. that way okay. there we don't have to play Mickey Mouse and box. Good idea. Yeah. Thank uh, you. Could you tell us who you are? Yes, my name is David Rosenberg. I live in Norfolk, Massachusetts, and okay. I uh, appreciate having the opportunity to address the commission. Um, I know that I'm going to give you uh, four minutes. I will try to. Mm -hmm. do, do you think you need more time? Maybe five. All right, go ahead. Five minutes. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, I, I know that since you uh, applied for to join the Citizens Commission, you must understand the problem uh, that we're facing. In fact, just following the national news would inform you and probably scare you about the problem. Uh, for example, in order to be reelected, members of the U.S. Congress are forced to devote a large proportion of their time to fundraising rather than doing their jobs. I'm told that it isn't unusual to spend 50% of their time in fundraising. Um, the likelihood of legislation being enacted is almost completely independent of the public support or disapproval. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the likelihood of legislation being enacted is uh, significantly affected by the support uh, or disapproval of billionaires, special interests, and wealthy corporations. And corporations um, can, in effect, veto legitimate laws by claiming that those laws violate their inalienable constitutional rights that they assert they have through corporate personhood. Uh, in order to remedy the situation, we need an amendment to the U.S. Constitution that affirms that the rights protected by the Constitution of the United States are the rights of individual living human beings only, not the rights of artificial entities of any kind, be they legal entities, aggregations of people, robots, or artificial intelligent entities. And uh, that money spent to influence elections is not protected free speech and must be regulated to ensure equal access to the political process for all Americans. Nineteen states have called on Congress to propose such an amendment, and Congress has not acted. Since all currently serving senators and congressmen got elected through the current process, it's working for them. So the required two-thirds majority are not likely to propose a change. Looking back at how Congress was motivated to propose amendments that they resisted in the past, we see that uh, states calling for a limited amendment um, proposing convention has worked, and in some cases it's the only way that uh, we were able to motivate Congress to propose a needed uh, amendment um, with, with the threat of uh, a limited amendment uh, proposing convention as the number of states calling for a convention approached the two-thirds required. Uh, some people have been scaremongering that we can't uh, risk an amendment proposing convention because it might run away. But we need to call for a limited uh, amendment proposing convention um, because that's the only way to motivate, motivate Congress to act. Um, it is very unlikely that there actually would be an amendment proposing convention because Congress has never let that happen. Every time we came close in the past, Congress has always decided that they prefer to propose the desired amendment themselves rather than allow an amendment proposing convention to do it. There's considerable legal uh, opinion that an amendment proposing convention can in fact be limited to the specific topic for which it was called. If a limited amendment proposing convention were actually convened and if it did run away and propose an amendment that was beyond the scope of its limited charter, the three quarters of the states needed to ratify an amendment is sufficiently high to bar, um, uh, as a sufficiently high bar to prevent ratification. And lastly, comparing the extremely low risk of the chain of a limited amendment proposing convention actually being convened and the convention actually proposing an amendment that went beyond their scope and that uh, the out of scope amendment actually um, was ratified by three quarters of the states, that's an extremely low risk compared with a relatively high prior probability that um, with no amendment proposed, things will continue getting worse. Ordinary citizens will have less and less influence over our government. And it's clear that we have to take, extreme, have to take the extremely strong ri small risk to avoid the otherwise almost, prob almost prob certain probability that our democracy will be replaced by a corpor corporatocracy. Remembering our Commonwealth's place in history, Massachusetts must 
add our voices to those of the great movements of the past which sought to make the dream of democracy for all Americans a reality. Thank you. Could you spell your last name, please? Yes, Rosenberg, R-O-S-E-N-B-E-R-G. Um, I was going to hand you the written copy of that. My oh, thank you very much, Tom. Thank you very much. We appreciate your thoughtful uh, commentary. And obviously, those are all issues that the Commission will be grappling with in the months ahead, and those are all things that we will take uh, into consideration. But thank you very much for raising, uh, raising them for us once more in this forum. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to do so. Thank you. So is there, yep, I see you. Yeah, will you come over and, and sit right over there, please? Thank you. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Will Boy, and I am the Outreach Manager for American Promise. Um, and I want to thank you all so much for having me today. Um, thank you for the opportunity to submit this testimony on behalf of American Promise, a cross-partisan, non-profit organization working to secure the rights of people by, right, secure government of the people, not by money, um, by winning a 28th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Like I said, my name is Waboy Gadru, and I'm the Outreach Manager for American Promise. I also had the distinct pleasure of working on question two ballot committee that established this commission um, since the fall of 2017. It's so humbling that after almost a year and a half of grassroots advocacy, this historic commission is finally here, pushing our nation forward to a government of equal citizenship, human liberty, and a responsible self-government. American Promise is leading the effort nationally to pass and ratify a constitutional amendment to secure these principles of equal citizenship, human liberty, and responsible self-government, bringing to bear deep expertise on the amendment, executing a strategy to move Congress through our amendment pledge, and convening the movement annually at our National Citizen Leadership Conferences and through our collaborative Writing the 28th Amendment program. American Promise is a cross-partisan organization, which means that we are not nonpartisan in that we encourage people to bring their political views with them to their support for this amendment. But, set, but we also set aside our differences when it comes to working together on this critical issue that so many of us agree on. Nor are we bipartisan in that supporters of American Promise are Democrats, Republicans, Independents, Greens, Libertarians, and all other political identities. And this diversity is reflected on our advisory board, staff, and membership. In my capacity at American Promise, I've had the pleasure of working with citizen leaders across the nation who are eager to decrease money out, money's outside influence in our political system. In working with these incredible citizens, I've witnessed the awesome power of this movement and its ability to bring Americans together, even in times of great political division. The creation of this commission is one such story. I started at American Promise in September 2017 as a citizen empowerment coordinator. And one of my first assignments was to help organize the People Govern Not Money Ballot Committee's statewide network of over 500 volunteers in gathering the 100,000 signatures needed to create question two. Truthfully, this task was quite easy because these incredible citizen leaders were determined to succeed. Over the course of that year, we petitioned voters in all conditions, rain or shine. Every Monday night, we would have a captain's call where each captain of these different areas of the state would enthusiastically shout out how many signatures we'd gathered that week, tips on how to better engage voters, and events to attend in the coming days to garner more signatures. This group was able to generate over 150,000 conversations statewide around the issue of big money in politics and the solution of the 28th Amendment. In our conversations, a, cute, a, cute, a few key themes emerged. One, the voters of Massachusetts care a great deal about the issue of money in politics and know that there must be something done about it. Two, people easily understood the issue. It really didn't take much convincing for Bay Staters to support this initiative. And three, this question brought together unlikely people. Republicans, independents, and Democrats alike signed on to support the creation of this commission. In such times of political division, 
it is so heartening to see that unity and cross-partisan collaboration can work together to achieve incredible things. This spirit of cross-partisanship is also re reflected in the incredible victory we had in November that mandated the creation of this commission that I said before today. Every single city and town in the Commonwealth voted overwhelmingly in favor to establish this commission. 71% of Massachusetts voters banded together over question two, which is more than any other voting topic last year. Our victory in, New Ham in uh, Massachusetts is not an anomaly, however. These citizen-led cross-partisan wins are happening all over the nation. Just two weeks ago in New Hampshire, um, it became the 20th state to call on Congress to pass this constitutional amendment. And this is the result of the incredible groundwork New Hampshire citizen leaders have done to pave the way to this historic victory. There's more information about the New Hampshire victory, but I would like to paint a little bit more of the national uh, picture. How much time do I have left? You know, have about 30 seconds. Okay. Um, essentially, over 800 cities and towns in America have called for a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United and related court cases. 207 and seven of these communities are right here in Massachusetts. These, seeing these conditions, American Promise has positioned ourselves to be the most strategic in translating these grassroots support for an amendment into Congress and act in, into action in Congress. Um, there's plenty of more information here in my testimony. That okay, well, thank you. We have your written testimony. Yes. And be part of the record. So thank you very much. Thank you, and I also Kevin, have- may I ask a question? Yes, go ahead. Uh, thank you for those comments. Uh, very, very interesting. This is Bill speaking, Bill Martin. Uh, the 71 percent uh, voted in favor of the ballot question. Do you know uh, how many votes that represented? Uh, I do not off the top of my head, but in my testimony, I do have a link to uh, that exact figure, and that goes over uh, how that's broken down in each county and also by party. Excellent. That'd be an interesting data point. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, yes, sir. I'm charged up. Okay, go ahead, sir. Okay. My name is John Blumensteel, B-L-U-M-E-N-S-T-I-E-L, and I'm from Sharon, Massachusetts. Okay. And I'm certain everyone in this room is aware of our current economic, political, and environmental crises. It is likely the most difficult time we have faced since the Vietnam War and the civil rights struggle. It is not unreasonable, think it may even be worse, considering global environmental collapse, perpetual war, and a gridlocked political system that is incapable of solving our problems. The role of money in these crises is of no small matter. Yes, the 60s were tumultuous, but our current crisis may be terminal to our democracy. This process, the commission process, is an attempt to set things straight, with no less a need and a goal than to preserve our democracy. Currently, there are at least two bills or resolutions in Congress that appear to be remedies to this problem, but have diametrically opposite outcomes. HJ2, HJR, HJ Resolution 2, states that Congress and the states shall have the power to regulate, but not the requirement to regulate. HJ Resolution 48 states that Congress and the states shall regulate money and politics. This slight wording change makes a major difference. One requires that they shall, the other states that they merely may. Allow me an analogy. Our basic driving regulations throughout this country are standardized. They unequivocally state that drivers shall stop for red lights and shall stop for stop signs. Hundreds of thousands of people are alive and whole today because these regulations are unequivocal. We shall stop at red lights and stop signs, not that we may. A vibrant, sustained democracy will only survive going forward if our state and federal legislators are constitutionally mandated to state that they shall regulate money in politics. They have had many years when they may have done that regulation, but have chosen not to and have been barred from such regulations as a result of Citizens United. We can no longer give them the option. The efforts of the individual states to promote a constitutional amendment to assertively regulate the influence of money in our political process is crucial. We have just spent two painful years evaluating the influence of a foreign government in our political process while we continue to turn a blind eye 
to the anti-democratic influence of unregulated U.S. money in our political process. We must defend our democracy and our political processes from all undemocratic, anti-democratic influences. Finally, I commend you for taking on this task. The quiet work of your commission may not seem jazzy, sexy, or worthy of great headlines. But when you look at it thoughtfully, the importance of your efforts stands perhaps only second in line behind the original work in Philadelphia that created our dynamic U.S. Constitution. It has survived a history of great struggle and turmoil with many adaptations as the times and the people required. The recommendation you make will have a deep impact on the continuing durability and the further longevity of our currently eroding 240-year-old democracy. Thank you for your time and for your efforts. Thank you very much for your testimony. Do you have a written copy of mine? Can I send it to your okay. website because this is cut and paste and messy. If you can send it to the website, that would be great. Thank, Thank you. you. And do we no? back and forth? Kim Wass uh, with People Govern Not Money, and I just wanted to take um, a brief couple of moments just to tell you about um, People Govern Not Money and and the, the, the people that work to to get this question on the ballot. Thank you. Um, so when the, when People Govern Not Money was formed to get to get question two on the ballot, it was a completely volunteer led effort um, with support from American Promise and. 400 plus voters from all over the state signed on to help. And Nancy Heselton and myself um, organized as, as volunteers ourselves, um, never having worked on a, on a political campaign or, or previously been active. And I just wanted to mention that the, the, the people on behalf of all these volunteers were just amazing and came from all walks of life, from all over the state of Massachusetts. Young and old, there was a 92 year old woman in a senior living facility who, who collected um, more signatures than, than, than many other people on this campaign. So folks were really dedicated and it was really a, a year and a half effort and, and often most people didn't know what they were getting into but sort of kept going. So we had, as you know, the process, it was in the fall, we were collecting 80,000 signatures and then in the spring, the, the next phase of the campaign and then um, everybody jumped on board to then educate Massachusetts voters. And somewhere along the way, we asked, you know, what's motivating you to, to devote so many hours to collecting signatures in all kinds of weather, um, weekends, holidays? And again and again, we heard the same thing. We recognize that Citizens United is the root of many other issues that we care about. And without an amendment, our work on these issues can't really take hold. So this is where we feel that we can make the most impact. And so we had volunteers who are passionate about a lot of other issues and, and members of other organizations. And they all came together, including, I should say, people in this room um, uh, from, from other organizations as well. So I should also say that besides collecting signatures, volunteers wrote letters to the editor. They spoke on radio shows. Um, they spoke in ballot question forums, at meetings of their organizations and other organizations in their towns throughout Massachusetts. <laughs> And fast forward, the commission is formed, um, and our volunteers are ready to help. So we have volunteers who have already coming to us saying, we have leads for testimonials. We have people ready to testify. Um, we work to coordinate uh, committees that can help support your committee. So we now have a, we have a communications committee, and we have a research committee, and Liz Ty, who uh, did a lot of um, behind the scenes and amazing work with the ballot campaign is heading up a research committee, a social scientist um, by trade. So um, we'll be in touch now that we know who, who um, is, is on your committees. And we're, we're here to lend support. And I, I would say that our volunteers are really committed to seeing the success of the commission and, and, and hoping that this becomes a model in Massachusetts for other states working toward the 28th Amendment. And Kim, what city of Panama? Um, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Okay. Thank you very much. I can provide you written testimony. Okay. Appreciate that. 
Good evening. Uh, my name is Paul Lowenstein. I live in Sharon, Massachusetts. I uh, provided each commissioner with an envelope with information in it, and I'd like to share with you uh, the cover letter which describes what's inside. Enclosed, you will find two envelopes. The first envelope, labeled the amendment, contains materials advancing the proposition that we need an imperative, unequivocally worded constitutional amendment such as H.J. Res. 48, to overturn anti-democratic Supreme Court decisions such as Citizens United versus FEC that threaten our republic and even life on our planet. A passive amendment such as H.J. Res. 2 <clears throat> would not require Congress to enact campaign finance reforms to provide political equality for all nor would it require the courts to reserve unalienable constitutional rights for real people. H.J. Res. 2 would be worse than no amendment at all because it would preempt an effective amendment and accommodate the political corruption at the heart of the problem. The second envelope labeled the convention contains materials advancing the proposition that the need for such an amendment is so urgent that Massachusetts should join the other five states that have already called for a limited amendment proposing convention pursuant to Article 5 on the topic of overturning Citizens United. Thank you for volunteering to serve as commissioner. Your recommendations will be pivotal, pivotal in reviving our great experiment in self-government and realizing the vision of government of, by, and for the people. Take inspiration from the founders and President Lincoln who established and preserved a republic once regarded as a beacon of democracy for the rest of the world, then boldly recommend an amendment that would fix our broken democracy and a strategy for achieving it. And also, I'd just like to mention there's a list of 49 online videos on this topic. Feel free to call or email me, and I'll send you the PDF with clickable links. And also in that uh, package is uh, someone asked about the number of voters at, in the ballot question last November. There were two ballot questions that were circulated in 2012 and 2014 that provided 1.1 million voters with an opportunity to weigh in on this issue. Of those, 77.7% uh, voted yes, that we need a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United, and those results on a town-by-town -town basis are provided within your information package. Also, I'd just like to request that, um, that in future meetings be publicly noticed, maybe a schedule put out with the next three months of meetings so we can plan ahead. Um, I just, I didn't realize there had already been two meetings. I found out about this one through the grapevine. So, I, and I didn't notice a, a, a clipboard being circulated to find out who's here. I would assume that everybody who's here would be interested in knowing what the schedule is for the future. So I just appreciate something like that. So thank you very much for the opportunity to weigh in this, this evening. I appreciate it. Thank you. Is there someone else? Yes. Yeah. I'm Janice Jones, and I'm from Maynard. Um, my testimony is going to be very brief because Paul Wallenstein said much of what I would have said anyway, and he probably said it better than I would. But the reason why I wanted to testify is to read part of a prepared statement about the importance of this work. Um, this is in the context, I'm part of a group called We the People Massachusetts, all volunteers. And we try, we help the American Promise in gathering signatures and we support, I think we have a mutual respectful and supportive relationship. And we're trying to pass. Get a little closer to you so we okay. get you talk. <clears throat> Sorry, okay. We're trying to pass a strong, we want to see a strong, effective constitutional amendment to address this issue. Mainly, the amendment described in H.J. Res. 48, which we all has been mentioned already. Um, you know, reading from my statement, the We the People Amendment, you know, that's a common expression used for that amendment, is necessary because big money special interests have gained undue power over governments and the American people. This includes weakening environmental laws, labor and consumer protections, 
promoting mass incarceration of minorities, inhibiting the deployment of sustainable energy technologies. And I think that's the biggest red flag of all of these. And bankrupting the government by ramming through massive tax cuts for the rich and multinational corporations. Finally, the amendment would restore the balance of power by restricting the ability of corporations and billionaires to overturn laws protecting ordinary Americans from buying excessive influence. Now, climate change is the big elephant in this room. And I'm, I'm, I'm speaking extemporaneously. We can't wait to dither over procedures and what if, what might happen with a runaway convention. We have runaway climate change. We have runaway carbon in our atmosphere. We need to address this ASAP. We need to address this last year. And this is one of the biggest reasons why I'm part of this group, because money is at the root of this. You can't turn that, turn, you can't turn that situation around without addressing the money and the undue influence. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sam Fieldman, Afton, Massachusetts. Uh, there were several things I wanted to... Could you spell your last name? I uh, like the two words, Fieldman, F-I-E-L-D-M-A-N. -E okay. uh, there are a few things I wanted to say, but before I do, I just wanted to point out an oversight made by the commission. There were four uh, subcommittees that you guys had voted on uh, last time. Uh, in earlier today, the fourth one was listed as drafting, but when you actually voted on it last, one, last time, the fourth one was action. And that's in that's consistent. Well, thank with, you. Do, do you have any testimony about the uh, substance? I do. Uh, okay. I would just, but I would also like uh, to, that that is substantive, uh, with all due respect, because it's important that the commission do the appropriate finding of fact in order to meet its sure. obligations under the uh, section. So we had a discussion about that. Go ahead and, and testify, uh, other than the procedure. Uh, okay. I mean, I. I'm the uh, national counsel for an organization called Wolfpack, mm -hmm. which seeks to overturn Citizens United. We also helped out uh, with, uh, with people that were not money on, uh, on Proposition 2. Um, and, we have, uh, and, and we're seeking to use the Article 5 convention process to over, uh, overturn Citizens United. Um, uh, and last time we talked about uh, presenting and recommending some witnesses uh, to talk to that subcommittee subcommission on the action items uh, so that we could so that you could properly understand the legal and political facts that you need to find in order to uh, meet your mandate under uh, section 4 part a subsection 5 to make recommendations for actions to be taken by Congress the general court of Massachusetts the governor the secretary of the Commonwealth the Attorney General and other public officials bodies and citizens of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts uh, to further promotion, proposals, and ratification of the recommended uh, constitutional amendment or amendments. Uh, without an appropriate finding of fact, uh, it would be very difficult for the, uh, if not impossible, for the commission to uh, meet that mandate in its report. And so I would uh, request uh, so that I can help, uh, and I'd be happy to help with the research of submitted information to the commission before uh, about that, uh, which I submitted last time. It's, you can read it at wolf pack.com slash MA review, which I gave the commission at the last hearing. Um, and I'd, I'd like to request that the commission uh, appoint members to that subcommittee so you can do the appropriate finding of fact. Thank you. I mean, we will do that. And just as a, as a point of clarification, the subcommittees or the committees that we uh, designated today are not necessarily exhaustive and the commission reserves the right to appoint um, any necessary subcommittees uh, at any point in the future and to constitute those committees with appropriate members as they, uh, that becomes um, possible necessary. So uh, that was not, that this was meant to be a start and not um, a complete list of all the committees that will ultimately be part of this commission. Sure, and Wolfpack is, uh, is also probably going to be holding an information session for uh, state legislatures that has not been set in stone yet, uh, but we would like to invite um, all the members of the commission and especially uh, any subcommission that's meant to deal with the procedure 
uh, to listen to that. And uh, when that's set in stone, we'll, uh, we'll communicate that to all the members of the commission. Thank you. At the same time, if we have more than a quorum, if we have a quorum of the committees present to have any such <coughs> gathering, or, you know, the then they wouldn't be able to. Public, public uh, meeting tomorrow. Oh, Certainly, we, we would not take questions from commission members there. Any questions from commission members would have to wait till the next uh, public yeah. meeting. And we, you know, a quorum of this committee could meet at any time to listen, as long as we didn't yeah. speak with one another. We, we would ensure, this would be something that we would do for legislators, but we would also invite uh, commission members there, and we would ensure not to take any questions from commission members specifically to make sure that we're in compliance with the open meeting law. Thank you very much. Thank you. And yes. My name is uh, Greg Blonder from uh, Brookline, Massachusetts. Could you spell your last name? Sure, it's my, like my hair is Blonder, B-L-O-N-D-R, with a little bit of a hat. Um, uh, I'm also a professor at Boston University as well as the executive director of an organization called WeAmen.us, which is working on crowdsourcing a uh, new Bill of Rights for America. Uh, we believe that trying to push single amendments like this through, especially ones that are not uh, acute in their uh, critical in their uh, uh, impact is unlikely to happen. And I want to explain why and talk about what the committee might work on in terms of tactics, because we should not write the amendment to we understand the tactics that we're going to use to get it approved. Um, there have been over 11,000 amendments uh, proposed in Congress since the founding of this country. 33, 33 only have been uh, sent out for ratification. Um, in addition to that, uh, uh, only one quarter of the states and one quarter of the uh, senators are needed to block or veto a uh, amendment for making it to the states. Those are very high odds. In order to get them passed, either one of two things happen. Either the amendment is uh, critical, the Civil War, led to the 13th, 14th, and 15th, 18-year-olds uh, voted, came out of the uh, Vietnam War, and so on. Or, in most cases, it's due to a compromise. The Constitution itself is a series of messy compromises everything from slavery um, to having a Senate as well as a House, and so on. Messy compromises. The amendments that we've seen so far are unfortunately, and I say this because I'm very passionate about campaign finance reform, unfortunately extremely unlikely to pass uh, the requisite three quarters of the states, and I'll explain why. Um, there are three things that are going to make it difficult for the passion in this room to result in a national amendment. Uh, for, first of all, there is no call to action. There is no civil war. This is, this is a disease that's rotting away America, but no one day is anyone sick. And for that reason, it's very hard to get people out to the polls in every state. Um, it just simply is not has the tenor of the other amendments which have uh, passed. Uh, second of all, um, when you look at um, the amendments themselves, they're written in such a way that the, uh, and we've heard some discussion about this before, about the amendments. If they talk about things will be or even shall be, it's still up to Congress and the courts to actually implement it. And look at the sorry situation in Congress. Congress for the last 10 years has not passed a regulation requiring the SEC to require companies to report how much money they spend on political campaigns. Something that simple. We cannot rely on them to do it on this particular issue. This particular issue is not getting the traction that's required in order for this to become um, an amendment that's going to pass by all the state, well, by three quarters of the states and pass through Congress. What's needed, I believe, is a more pra and also the other thing, the third thing is, oh, sorry, I meant three, forgot, uh, is that despite the fact that polls show really serious interest in campaign finance reform, depending on who asked the question, 60 to 8 percent of America has some interest in campaign finance reform. The reality is, is that it doesn't translate the passion at the polls. And I've run a lot of companies. I've marketed a lot of products. You can go out and ask people if they want to buy something, and they say yes. But when they go to the stores, they don't actually purchase it. When we look at um, things like Google search terms, um, the excitement around videos on this topic versus other topics that could be constitutional amendments, the, the actual excitement is low. 
And this has been discussed by other political scientists and other people in the past. And so those are the reasons I'm worried that if we go about this directly trying to make a hard-edged amendment, which has a very strong, we're going to find it to fail. And this would be a child's crusade, one that's noble, but it would be a child's crusade. Instead, I think we need to ask ourselves, what kind of amendment would be passed by three quarters of the states? And this is going to require giving away some things in order to get something of higher value. And in this small amount of time, I can't discuss the kind of trade-offs one might see. But I believe we could create an amendment which gets most of the value that we want on this subject and related speech subjects while giving away things that other people want. For example, corporations being people and other issues. We're going to have to compromise to get this one done. That's just my opinion based on studying the surveys and looking out into the past that, uh, and I don't want this to be a failure. I don't want this just to be an activity that people feel good about, but at the end of the day cannot get passed. So uh, we should think about the tactics. We could ask at a state-by-state, -state, fine grain level, what it will take to get passed. And let me remind you that, that so many people benefit from these campaign finance uh, donations from large corporations. Some states are owned by large corporations, and there are serious free speech issues that associations worry about in the amendments that are currently being passed that I think it's going to be difficult to get the three quarters approval with any of the amendments that I've seen. So that's, that's my one plea, is that we need to really rethink it as going to war and asking, what does it take to win the battle? That's so we'd be interested in your... Thank you. Thank you very much. We'd be interested in, in your further... I'd be glad to talk to one of the subcommittees or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, there's more time. Thank you. And so B-L-O-N-D-E-R. Yes, it, from Boston University. Boston University. Thank you very much. Do we have someone else who would like to testify? I don't see anyone. I don't see any hands up. Okay, so uh, all... all we have about 25 people here, but all the people who would want to testify have testified. Um, so at this point, I think we need to look at scheduling our next uh, meeting, and, and if we can schedule a meeting after that, and if we can schedule two or three meetings, that's great, but I guess we need to start with, with the first meeting. Uh, and do we, uh, Bill or Custis, do you have a, do you have a, a thought on when we should have our next meeting and perhaps where, well, what city um, or town? What Bill and I have been hoping is that um, now that the committees, at least these initial committees have been constituted, to give the committees some time to at least start their work and uh, perhaps meet, but at the very least uh, start thinking about the kinds of questions they might have, gathering some information, etc. Uh, and um, give them some time to do that so that at our next full commission meeting we can have reports from these committees. Um, so we um, had a date in mind for a follow-up meeting, but we were thinking sometime in, at the earliest, um, mid-July, and um, also putting together a fuller schedule of meetings um, beyond that for the full commission so that they can be scheduled in advance that I know uh, Bill had been uh, working on, and, and we're going to propose some regular meeting times for the late summer and going into the fall. Okay, so mid-July, um, so... What do we think, Kevin, about uh, three or four weeks from today? Three or four weeks from today? Okay. Yeah, I don't have my calendar in front of me. But... No, I do. So... Yeah, three. Yeah, three weeks from today would be the week of July fifteenth through the through the nineteenth. Um, today we're meeting on a Monday. Are, are Mondays especially good for people? Are Thursdays good for people? Or what 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 would be a good day for people? Thursday, the eighteenth, would be a good day for me. <laughs> it won't be a good day for me. I will be in Costa Rica. Okay. Um, other people? What date was that again, Carmen? Uh, the, the Thursday, July 18th. We, we, Monday is, a, is the 15th. Uh, Tuesday is the 16th. Uh, Wednesday the 17th. Thursday the 18th. 
Friday the 19th. What, uh, so who, uh, who has, a, so we have, anyone else have a problem with, uh, with the 18th? Uh, you know, we have at least one, Joyce has a, Sanchez has a problem with the 18th. Anyone else have a problem with that? Well, what about uh, uh, Monday the 15th? People have problems with the 15th? Can you hear me? I have a conflict. What's that? You have a conflict. Okay, anyone else have a conflict with the 15th? Okay, what about um, Tuesday the 16th? Anyone have a conflict with Tuesday the 16th? Yeah, I can probably go on Tuesday. That, that's a problem? It's a yes or a no. We're looking for no's. We're, not, we're looking for no's. Is the, is, do you, does anyone have a problem with Tuesday the 16th? Uh, Nico Fui has a problem with Tuesday the 16th. Okay, thank you. And what about uh, Wednesday the 17th? Anyone have a problem with Wednesday the 17th? I think that's our next meeting date, Wednesday, July 17th. Sounds like a winner. Okay. Now, where shall we meet? We've met in Boston twice. Now we've met in Metro West, and we have the large, second largest city in the Commonwealth, uh, which is Worcester. Uh, we, have, we have other places, uh, Fall River, New Bedford, for the southern part of the state. Uh, we could meet in Springfield. That's a pretty big city. Yeah, it is. It is. Springfield, absolutely. And we've got Pittsfield also. So would you like to meet? Who would like to meet in Springfield? I'm happy to meet in Springfield. Is there someone who can explore location there? So, um, I think I think I could probably help us get a location in Springfield. Um, I think yeah, I think that's doable uh, for the fifteenth. I think probably within the week I should be able to probably w within less than a week probably get a location in Springfield. Right. Yeah. The, Well, yeah, that's good. That's an idea. And also, you know, there is a community college in Springfield. Perhaps we could meet at the community college in Springfield. That sounds excellent. We want to think of uh, 5 to 7 p.m. again on uh, July 17th in Springfield. That sounds good. Is that, does that work for people? Yes. Yep. Okay. So... Do we, so do we, we, we don't want to be scheduling a, a second, another meeting at this point, or? Uh, my suggestion to your comment is, uh, Constance and I have just started the process of planning out the next couple of months. Yeah. Give us more time and let us come to the meeting on the 17th. Okay. And then we'll have uh, also done more coordination with the subcommittees. And uh, we, we do want to publish uh, several meetings in advance. But okay. uh, let us bring that the group on July 17th. All right, so why don't we plan to meet on Wednesday, July 17th at Springfield Community College, 5 to 7 p.m. And um, do we have any other business, any other business to take up? Well, just one final thought from me, this is Costas, that um, we will send around uh, a listing of the committees as they will constitute it. There is an to the committee chairs to uh, follow up and, um, and for next steps. But the committees at this point should feel free to start engaging in their work. Uh, so you don't need anything um, special, special from us to, okay. to, to start uh, thinking about that. So please reach out to us and let us know if you're having any issues or questions or concerns. Uh, but we're going to assume that the committees will start their work between now uh, and, um, and the next meeting and, and have something to report to the group as a whole at that time. Okay, thank you. Can you hold on just a second. I wanted to take a question from... It's, it's yes. just a quick comment about locating the meeting. Yes. Uh, to my knowledge, there are no uh, known Republicans on the committee, although there might be some closet ones. It, it might be useful to use the voting data to find some part of the state which didn't vote as strongly for this commission. It would be interesting to get there. Is there no region which did not? There is not. Every town. Yeah, everything was a super. Okay. Because it, 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 it would be.
good to have other voices. Uh, so the, uh, the, the, uh, the question or the comment um, was, you know, is there a part of the state, is there, is there a large city or a town in a part of the state that didn't, you know, vote by the majority for this commission? And we, we learned that really it was uniform throughout the state that, uh, that the creation of this commission was desired. Thank you. So, uh, do we have other business to, oh, one, one other question or so comment. From, this yes. is another suggestion for your next meeting. Yeah, I, uh, Why don't you, can you come forward so that, so, so that the other committee members can yeah. hear you and yeah, go ahead. I, I'd like to um, suggest or request that for your next meeting, you um, allow uh, members of the public to uh, call in to at least monitor it, so if they can't participate. So, uh, Mr. Rosenberg. Yes. Yeah. So we have some technical issues. So for example, uh, at this meeting and at another meeting, uh, technically we could only figure to get six lines coming in. So. Carmen. Yes. Yes. Uh, we, uh, in other meetings, this is Boba Malone. Yes, um, Boba. In other meetings, we talked about finding other ways as well uh -huh. for um, the community to participate. So sure. that's our committee work, the communication um, committee work. So that's um, that's something that we we would definitely want Great. to look into. And one of my other, one of um, the suggestions that I, uh, I would have as well is one of the gentlemen, I'm not sure if it's the same person, had mentioned that he just found out about this meeting and didn't know that the commission had already started meeting. And I'm not sure if we would want to do this or if it's possible or if this might be the communication committee work. But I'm wondering if we can um, record our meeting. Because I think, uh, you know, from listening through, through listening through the phone um, and being a part of this meeting on the phone, I feel that, um, you know. Uh, so, Boba, this meeting has been recorded. This meeting has been videotaped by the, uh, this meeting has been videotaped by the uh, Access Framingham, um, uh, which is the public, public television channel in Framingham. And I think it would be a good idea, you know, for us to continue to, yeah, to uh, videotape think, our I meetings, yeah. Yeah, I think that would be a great idea. And, and this, this will be on demand. This will be accessible on demand. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Boba. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, I, I do understand the difficulty with a six-person bridge or six-line yeah. bridge. I think that there are um, computer-mediated services. I'm thinking of freeconferencecall.com. I'm thinking of... Um, um, Google Hangouts or, or equivalent things that would free conference call .com. Com, Yeah, is the name of the service. I think it allows up to 200 participants. Well, that would work very well. Um, free conference call I'd, 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 I'd be happy to talk to you okay, outside great. of this about great. other possibilities. Sure. But thank you very much for considering thank the idea. I think sure. there are a lot of people who are interested in the commission's work, and Springfield isn't convenient for everybody. Right, right, okay, right. No, thank you. Right. Thank you. Great, so we want to respect everyone's time. If there's no sure. other uh, business, uh, we should probably ask. Is, the is, there, is there a motion uh, yeah, to adjourn? Oh, sir, one moment, please. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just one moment. On Wednesday, July 17th from 5 to 7 p.m. at Springfield Community College. I'll make that motion. I second that. Do you want to repeat the motion? It's our next meeting at Springfield Community College. Okay. All right, and it was seconded. seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? It was unanimous. Thanks. So now we need a motion to adjourn. Right. Hold on just a moment. Just a moment before we adjourn. Uh, yes. I have a question. I yeah. can ask it from here. Sure. How no, you, you're, not, you're not. You need I to come closer to the record. Okay. How can we find the minutes of previous meetings. All right, the question was how, how can the public find the minutes of previous meetings? It should be at, the, uh, at our website, isn't that right? Which is? Which is? Yeah, those meetings are in the process of being loaded into the website as perhaps people in the room can understand. Yeah. Uh, we've been mobilizing as uh, volunteers 
Yeah. Uh, trying to set up a website, get together for communication, various other administrative detail. Uh, we seek to get these resolved as soon as possible so that we get out of the substance and content of the matter. Yeah. But we, you know, uh, are still in the process of getting some of those things ironed out. For example, conference call facilities. So the web, the website the hasn't gone live yet. Our site should be live, and I think Jeff plans to load the document. Uh, he hasn't done it already, you know, I would say shortly. So do we do we have a name for the website? I know it hasn't gone live yet, but do we have a name for it so you people can... Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. So we go to mass.gov, which is the state... Website. We go to mass.gov, yeah. Uh, mass.gov, yeah. okay. And in the search, uh, search location, put in Citizens Commission. Citizens and Commission. And will be linked right to our webpage. Citizens Commission in the, in the, in the, sur in the search. Okay, and that'll go to our web page. When the web page is alive. Right. Yeah, well, it's already alive. We oh. need to now put the minutes in, into the uh, website. Okay, oh, great, okay. So, so it's already live and we'll be putting minutes in. Okay. Yeah, so if somebody goes there now, you would see, for example, our name, uh, redacted versions of our biography. You would see certain information there already. Okay. And we're in the process of loading more information literally as we speak. Okay, great. So I, are we ready to vote? Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second? Second. Okay, so that was uh, Jay Marsden and, and Novo Thank Alexander you. seconded that. And uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody.